Welcome to the Listen to Your Footsteps podcast. I'm your host, Kojo Buffon, and this podcast is an extension of my book, also called Listen to Your Footsteps, which is a collection of essays, reflections, and poetry on things like fatherhood, identity and belonging, growing up, creativity, and the lessons learned. The purpose of this podcast is to gain insight and learn from the journeys that others have taken. I explore the worlds of art, culture, design, business, creativity, and life from the perspective of Africans who are contributing to the redefinition of the continent and who we are. Okay, so my guest today is an actor, radio presenter, author, speaker, activist, TV and film producer, certified counselor and life coach, and founder of Waka Agency, a pan-African talent agency. Rosie Mutene. Hi, Rosie. Hi, how are you today? Good, how are you? Good, good, good. No complaints. We have power today, so I'm happy. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we, were, you know, we were chatting about that earlier in, in terms of it's interesting how South Africa was always perceived as this oasis. And every time mm. I have had to call off an interview or a meeting or a call because we have what they're calling load shedding, but it's actually blackouts. I think load shedding just sanitizes what it actually is. <laughs> People say, oh, welcome to Africa. And I'm like, but it's been happening for like 14 years. So this is the idea that South Africa is this oasis where everything works very differently from the rest of the continent. Meanwhile, for those of us who live here, it's, mm. a, diff- it's a different story. Yeah. And, and also for me, I mean, with, as you know, with traveling, particularly West Africa, where the power outages are, have also been very frequent, but mm. communities have learned to adapt. So every household will have that generator on standby. Yeah. You know, here it's a luxury now. I mean, mm. you know, there's certain devices which, you know, you've mentioned before in personal conversations that you can buy and, you know, and just you can, you know, charge up your devices. But when you go to you, when you go to Nigeria, Ghana, they, all of these are set up. Absolutely. You know, so, so the rest of Africa's adapted. It's just South Africa's lagging behind. <laughs> so my first question to you is, what did Rosie, what did 10 year old Rosie want to do when she grew up? <laughs> She wanted to be an extravaganza dancer and make it in Las Vegas, believe it or not. <laughs> Why that? How did you see that? How did you interpret it? Or what was your perception of that kind of job? So my foster mom introduced me to tap dancing and dancing at a very early age. And I'll never forget my first lesson. It was just the sense of freedom and I loved learning how to do certain steps. I loved the stage. I loved performing. And then later on, probably when I was about eight or nine, maybe even a little bit older, Sol Kersner had opened up Sun City. Mm. And it was one of the few places where it was multiracial. And my family were, had, I was privileged enough to go with my family to see my first extravaganza show. And I was mesmerized by the feathers, by the lights, by the choreography, by everything. And I was like, that is where I want to go. That is who I want to be. It's interesting. You mean, you talk about, and I I will jump around a bit, but that's the nature of Mm -hmm. this. You know, you talk about foster family. You talk about what you're exposed to. How did you Mm -hmm. navigate identity? So while you're kind of growing up and figuring out what it is that you want to do with your life, How do you then figure out who you are as well? Yeah. Interesting, because I'm still navigating identity. At at an early age, it was denial. You know, just to give a bit more insight. So my mother was was a domestic worker working for a white Jewish family who raised me and was in the midst of apartheid because I was born 1974. So I was in a lot of denial. I went through a lot of self-hate. I remember as a kid praying to God, please make me up as a little white girl, because in my mind, in my warped understanding of what black and white was, was that black was very, very negative and white was the more superior. Mm. So throughout my teens, I went through that on top of dealing with just the crises as teenagers have. Yeah. The twenties, I saw the same thing. I'm very, once again, I was very privileged that I believe my ancestors carried me through a lot because being in my 20s and then realizing, okay, you're still dealing with this identity crisis, but I wasn't acknowledging it. So I would try and buffer that pain and, you know, went down that ugly rabbit hole of the heavy drinking, of the experimenting with drugs. That I'm fortunate that, you know, I never got hooked because it could have mm. been very, very easy to. 
uh, moving into my 30s where I had this, this existentialist crisis of who the F am I? Um, life wasn't going that great in Joburg. And then my parents, who I've obviously been visiting them, who live in Northwest Province in Pogang, I used to only go home like over Christmas or holidays. And then it got to a point where I was hardly ever visiting, just sending money and, and giving support. I realized that although I had that level of interaction, I didn't know who my parents were. Yeah. And so I packed up my life, went home, and it was supposed to be a couple of months of, I suppose, trying to find myself. And it turned out into nearly two years of discovering my father, who he was, because our relationship was very, 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 very distant. I also needed to acknowledge to myself that I resented him for a lot mm. of the things that he wasn't, which wasn't his fault. So my foster father and I had a great relationship and I couldn't understand why I couldn't have that loving relationship with my biological father. But then getting to know the most powerful and amazing man that he was, he passed away, unfortunately, 2015. And on, that, on his funeral, I just gave so much thanks because if I hadn't had those two years of getting to know him, I would have probably felt a lot more lost after he had passed. Yeah. And then also working on the relationship with my mom. And then to now, you know, over the last couple of years, working on trying to find myself and not being too hard on myself, because there's a lot of forgiveness that you can give, but forgiving yourself is one of the biggest things. And then also realizing that, you know, a lot of the choices that were made for me were made for me when I was a baby. So I had no control over it. And because I was brought up, there's certain mannerisms or certain things that you do that you do because of how you were brought up and because of the influences that you had and what you were exposed to and so forth. And why I said to you, you know, it's still a work in progress. So, you know, for a long time, it used to bother me when people would, you know, mock my accent because of the way I'm speaking. And now it's just, well, this is the way I am. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that I'm better than the next person, mm. but I can't, this isn't something that can change me. And, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was really triggered because I was having an argument with somebody and they, they turned around and said, he goes, yeah, but you, 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 you argue like a white woman. And yes, you can laugh that off, but, but knowing what my history is and how I, I've become so intentional on trying to find my African identity and trying to find my space and me and everywhere I go, that really hits a nerve. Um, and then it's also made me realize, okay, so there's still parts of me that I still need to work on. But also there's a lot of parts of me that I need to forgive myself for. Because a lot of the time we, we, we're so hard on ourselves and think, well, we need to fit into this mold. And actually, no. So, yes, it triggered me and, and, but I, and I got, got through it. But I acknowledge the fact that, that I had every right to be upset by that. But I'm also not defined by that type of yeah. comment anymore. Whereas before, it would, it would have carried on into everything else that I was doing. I had an interesting conversation recently with, I had a meeting with a, with, a woman and she was telling me about her daughter and her daughter was saying that she wishes and her daughter's in her twenties now, but she wishes there was, there was like a card or something like that would give an intro that would contextualize each of us. Right. In terms of what you're talking about, it's, you know, the way that I speak, the way that I think, the way that I walk, the way that I dress, all of those things are influenced by, you know, my context, like in my journey. Mm. Um, and I was saying to her, that, but the problem with that is that there's no one you can actually just bundle down into this nice little intro that would contextualize yeah. you for other, you. People, for other people. So, I mean, like you're saying, the work then is the internal, is getting mm. comfortable with the fact that, you know, this is who you are and these are, this, all of the bits and pieces make up who you are and that's all right. And you're not mm. going to, you're not going to let the, the external impact on you in such a way that it actually overshadows everything else that you do. Yeah. So true. You went so into, true. you, but you went into acting and I'm, I'm thinking about this conversation and I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking about that journey of figuring oneself out. And then mm. you went into, and also your background, but then you go into something where you, and in essence, inhabiting other people. Yeah. <laughs> you, you're playing dress up for other people and, and creating into this fantasy world. And I think from a subconscious level, I mean, my intention in the beginning was throughout most of my school, my mother was like, no, my foster mom was no, 
you should go into law or go into journalism. And I, you know, I entertained that. But when it came to me actually applying to this, I ended up going into, into acting. And my mindset at the time, I thought, well, it's still stage orientated. I can mm. still do my dancing and I could possibly live my dream because my family was like, you can do what you want after you get your degree. But then now in hindsight, looking back, it was also in my subconscious probably saying, well, going into a career where I didn't always have to be me. Mm. I could be this different character, whether it's on screen, whether it's on theater, whatever it is, but it's not, it's not really rosy. Because that character is also defined for you, right? Like you, you know, yeah. you're, you're, you're given a script, and, and you're you given a, a script, character profile yeah. and you're like, this is who it is. Yeah. And, and, and even then, and that's what I loved about theater was that you can build on that and create this whole fantastic, beautiful world around this character. You know, and then, and then, you know, and, and that is, that is, that is what you're getting paid for. That is what you're putting out. You're enjoying it. And then you can go back to my little secluded world where I'm still trying to figure out who I am. Yeah. I think I'm always fascinated by our journeys as people and, and how there's a lot of similarity, but then a lot of difference. Um, and, and how we, uh, you know, how we find different ways of answering the questions for ourselves. Yeah. You know, so the reason I ask about identity, because that's something that's been very much a part of my journey, but that mm -hmm. stems from my heritage. Yeah. But then also growing up in, you know, different spaces and different environments, like I had more angst or more confusion around identity when I came to South Africa than I did before. Mm. Because growing up in Lesotho, it, 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 because race wasn't tied to it. And, yeah. and, and in Lesotho, I was part of a family. I mean, even though in mm. my family, I, you know, I looked different in terms of complexion, in terms of features from my siblings, because we have different mothers. And my mm. mother was European but we were all my father's children. So it, was, it yeah. was easier within that space to kind of go, while I'm figuring out all the different, you know, elements in terms of my likes, dislikes, my personality, you know, what moves me, what hurts me, what saddens me, et cetera. Mm. I still had a space in the world. And in yeah. the city, I was in Tate Frank's son or, you know, Kweku, or if was older brother. So I, I always had a place or he's part of that group from that high school. Mm. But we, then when you come to South Africa, there's that whole definition yeah, of yeah. not only color, but then it's also elitism. It's how you speak. It's what your parents do. It's all of these things that, you know, I'm sure coming from an outside environment, it's like, what the hell is going on? Which box am I supposed to be in? Yeah. It took me a while, but I got to the point where it's just like, I, in, in varsity guys used to say, you must pick a side. You can't be on the fence. And wow. I just went, actually, do you know what? I can. Mm. And that was the start for me of kind of just being unashamedly myself. Mm. And and being comfortable with it. Yeah. You know, and kind of going, well, if you have a problem, that's your problem. It's not my problem. Yeah. And, and also depending on also how you've been brought up. So if you've had that confidence instilled in you and you see it and you know it as confidence, it's easier for to, to take that route. But whereas, you know, growing up, I never, ever spoke up. And if I did, I was told, okay, you know, it's either ego driven or calm down or you don't have a space to speak. Hmm. You know, and so fast forward, what, maybe 30 years, if not 40 years, where an incident happened in my foster family and I spoke up and the whole family was like, no, you don't have a right to speak up. And hmm. it was the first time that I'd really spoke it out on such a serious issue. It was an issue revolving around race. And I was told, no, you keep quiet because you need to know your place. And that was when one of my, my turning points happened because I was like, actually, no, my voice does have value and I do have a right to speak out and I will speak up, you know, and, and it was scary because I mean, you knew you, how old was I? I was already like in my, in my early thirties. Mm. And then suddenly you, 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 you're broaching this, this topic and you're not agreeing. Whereas before you just went with whatever and laughed at whatever. And, and it's a lonely road, but it's, I'm, I'm so happy and so proud of myself 
for for taking that charge and taking that stand when I did. Mm, in an essence, it's like coming into yourself. Yeah, literally. <laughs> There's a time. I mean, there was a time you were on our screens. You were quite involved with, you know, with the acting, etc. And then you kind of faded away. Mm. And I mean, you and I have been in each other's spaces, or on the fringes of each other's orbits for like many, many years, right? Before, <laughs> yeah, before we, yeah. before, before we actually even just had a conversation of sorts, right? Yeah. Uh, but yeah. we were always kind of floating around each other's orbits, and also because of the time that you were in, you know, you're on television and you were in theatre and etc. It was a, a very specific time in in the industry's evolution in South Africa, but especially in Joburg. Mm. And then at some stage it felt like, you know, like you'd see Rosie all the time and then all of a sudden you don't see Rosie anymore. And then you kind of mm. crop, you cropped up um, as a, a, what felt like a different iteration, right? But mm -hmm. what, are you still involved in, you know, are you still involved with kind of television and film and what took you off our screens? So great, great, great question because, yes, yeah, so, I mean, Generations was obviously my, my flagship show and I was doing theatre and I had the, the opportunity of touring with Dr. John Carney, so we toured the UK, Australia. And then while I was also presenting this magazine program called Studio 53 where I was fortunate to travel the continent, yes. I saw that there was a gap for representation, but also I saw that there was very, very small percentage of females taking up producer roles. So, for instance, on the show that I was on, all of the producers were male except for my boss. I think there was one in the beginning. And this interested me, and I thought, okay, well, is it because we are not welcome in the space or is it too difficult? And so I started to ask questions about the producers that I worked with and I had a rapport with and asked them to train me, and they were very, very welcoming to do so. And I realized that this is something that I also want to, to, to delve into because we know that, you know, your, your shelf life as an actress on TV is, is, has a certain amount of time. Mm. And so after I did Studio 53, I thought, okay, this is great. This is something that I want to do. But then I went into the film aspect and I realized, okay, this is a totally different beast altogether and I need to learn a lot more. So I made the intentional move on to, first of all, building up my, my, my agency and seeing how I can navigate the space of representing talent, but then also doing extra training and doing a lot more work on, in producing behind the scenes so that, that I can hold in my, my crafts and figure out, you know, which ones work for me and which ones don't. Mm. And for instance, the ones that don't, I went into reality TV for a short while. I did medical reality TV after the first season. I was like, thank you very much. This is not for me. <laughs> so, and I was able to walk away realizing, okay, I've ticked that box. That is definitely not the area that I want to produce in. Yeah. And then, then I also went, I started going through my existentialist crisis. So it all, all of this overlapped in, in, at around about the same time. And I thought, okay, well, when I go back to screen, I need to be a lot more comfortable with who this new person is becoming. I didn't know, didn't have a, um, I couldn't outline exactly who the new Rosie was or yeah. who the new Rosie is, but she's definitely changed and she's still finding her way. And then finally, when I was like, okay, ready to do it, and I got a role on a TV show, and it was supposed to be my major big comeback. It was a great character that I was playing. Uh, and unfortunately, the, the producers kept on trying to, to make me emulate sex scenes and, and do semi-naked. And, and I had a number issue with it. Number one, I didn't sign the contract that stated that. My contract said that I didn't have to do that. Hmm. But my concern was that although the character was racy, the show was still a, tea, a family show. So the channel would never, ever have signed off on me walking around in a G-string or anything hmm. like that. So it just it didn't make sense of why put an actors through that who didn't want to do it and who was uncomfortable in doing so. And then push to, to the limit where... You know, we had meetings with the producers, with my agent. They agreed, they apologized. And the next day, a script came and it was the same thing. And so literally trying to push me into a corner where my final scene went before before I resigned was the director was like, no, just, you know, we will put you in a boob tube. And then the cameraman's going in. And I was like, whoa, is nobody really listening to what I'm saying and, and what I've agreed to? And then I, I ended up resigning. And it was a big choice that I had to make because, 
I knew that I was already seen as a troublemaker because I, I spoke out. I'd also spoken out about another actress who had agreed to do certain sex scenes, but it, they didn't give her the respect that she deserved. So it was in a public space. Uh, it wasn't closed off. After the scene, she was made to walk across the across set in her in just in her g-string. Um, and obviously, I I I, I spoke up and mm. I spoke to the producers and saying, you know, this isn't how we. I'm old school, and that's not how things are supposed to be yeah. done, especially because it was a reputable production house. And so, I knew that making that choice to resign and to speak out. And later on, fortunately, the channel called me in to find out exactly what had happened. And and that was when I got my first apology because they said, okay, well, you know, we understand where you're coming from. This is not our ethos. This was not supposed to be in the script. I don't know why it was there anyway. You know, it also validated me. But then Mm. I knew that the rest of the industry wouldn't see it that way. And that's exactly what happened. And unfortunately, a couple of months later, the channel didn't renew the contract for another season for the show. And the production manager, when when was telling the cast and crew that they were, it wasn't going to be renewed, in his words were, well, you can thank Rosie McDonough for losing your job. Mm-hmm. And I heard this from three or four different sources. So I went, I left the industry deliberately to hone in my craft, came back. It was supposed to be a big thing. And then um, it was cut short. But then that opened up my area, my my avenue to to discovering other areas in, in with which I was still good at and my producing and obviously my activism played a big role in, in that decision. Uh, and then of course focus more on, on what a talent is. Yeah, I think I mean I think the you know the idea of power, mm. especially individual power, we we often I mean I'm I mean I speak as as a man who is so, sometimes part of the problem, but in terms of the, the way society is structured. But the whole thing around, I mean, I, f- I find it a lot, especially when you're talking to younger people, where mm. when they're in a situation, they feel like they have zero power to speak up. Mm. And that stems from that thing being the only thing, or they feel like it's the only thing that they can do. And it's the only yeah. path, it's the only path available to them to transform their lives. Yeah. Whereas, whereas being able to recognize, even when it's difficult, that we always have options, and and mm. sometimes sometimes it's a it's a sli- it's a ha- slightly harder road, but you'll feel much better for it, or you'll feel better for yeah. it because you have that alternative. Yeah, and also just from a family perspective, of because I've always, and especially because my relationship with my mum is really at a beautiful space. And we had just come out of this, this me moving home. And for me, I mean, I think if I was younger, it, it never, ever came up. I never, ever said that I wouldn't. I never, ever thought about it. The approach was never there. Mm. But for me, I'm just thinking, so my mother's going to see her, what, 40-year-old daughter on screen half naked. And there's nothing wrong with that because I'd never brought that into my career in the beginning. Yeah. And the mothers pick up. So my mother would have picked up that I was uncomfortable. Um, would I have been that authentic to my audience as well? Mm. You know, and what, one of the, the directors who I was, unfor- I was actually at varsity with said to me, he goes, yes, but when, when you were younger, you know, we all used to dance and used to take up your top and dancing on tables. And I was like, yes, that was in my 20s. This is a totally different scenario. And and it also made me realizing that although because with, with my activism career, which started many, many years ago, you know, you learn about the gaslighting, you learn about the different levels of intimidation, but then every now and then it creeps in to say, Okay, whoa, this is the stuff that you've been preaching. This is this is what you're creating awareness of. And and why it's so so easy for somebody just to succumb and say, Okay, you know what, bugger it, because of this pressure that people will put on you and say, well, you did it before back then, but, but taking it totally out of context, you know, and, and not really taking it into consideration. Like, first of all, I said no, but then does, is it necessary to put the person through it? And even the one producer even came back on, on their word and said, well, we probably won't even show those scenes anyway. I was like, well, then why put the actress through that if you're not going to show it? What, what's the point? What do you want to get out of that? Because even from a craftsman's perspective, you kind of go, okay, mm. does... Does the story, does carrying the story forward require that? Mm. Mm. And, you know, what does it seek to achieve as a 
you know, as a pillar in terms of this story that you're telling. Um, and like you're yeah. saying, what hap- what tends to happen is that, I mean, it's like the whole idea of microaggressions. Mm. Unfortunately, um, prejudice, whether it's, you know, sexism, misogyny, racism, etc., homophobia mm. tends to come in, it's subtle. It's in yeah. a particular word being included as opposed to being excluded. Right. It's, yeah. it's, it's the, it's the directing of the lens, but from a very subtle perspective. And, and unfortunately too few, I find too few people take the time to, you know, if, if everybody points left, I like to look mm. at, I like to look right. Cause I'm like, yeah. what are you, what are you distracting me from? <laughs> True. And wh- what is on the right? Let's, let's find out. Yeah. yeah. It could be better this time. Yeah. <laughs> you are listening to the listen to your footsteps podcast. A podcast in which I chat to Africans from across sections of society and sectors, including art, culture, design, business and creativity, to name a few. I delve into their journeys, the decisions they've taken to get to where they are, how they do what they do and everything in between. Essentially, we go wherever the conversation takes us. You know, and and if you you were, especially in this day and age where we live on headlines, right? Mm. I'll I'll get somebody interpreting... It recently happened in a WhatsApp group I'm part of, and somebody shared an article and the whole conversation. I mean, it's it's benign. It's about football, so it's nothing. You know, it's nothing. Well, for us, it is life changing, but it's nothing in the general scheme <laughs> of things life changing. Um, but there was this whole headline, and I went in and I read the article, and I'm like, but why is everybody co- concluding that it's X when? Mm when I read the sentence and the sentence says, why? Mm. You know, and I'm like, because this is the word, this is the language that was used. So Mm. until you can show me the language that says X, I'm just going to interpret it this particular way. And the guys are joking. Mm. They're like, okay, well, we're going to wait till you confirm because you're, you're always, you're, you're always going, yeah, but let's, 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 have you read the thing? Let's look at it, you know? Mm. And unfortunately, that's that's how, I mean, whether it's patriarchy, whether it's misogyny, whether it's homophobia, it's in, I guess because I work with words, it's in the, it's, it's in the subtle, the really, mm. the really subtle, the really nuanced meanings, which makes it very mm. hard for you to go, you see, this, pers- mm. this person is treating me this particular way. And everybody goes, yeah, but mm. they just said this. And it's like, no, 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 no. You need to, you need to understand the context. Mm, absolutely. Your activism, I mean, you, 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 like you said, it did start very, very early. And I know you, you mm. wrote your book. Where does the book fit in to that journey? Because it, it also felt, you know, from the outside looking in, it felt like a particular milestone and a, a transition. Yeah, it happened. The book happened out of chance, actually, because when I was going into the first acknowledgement of my, my existentialist crisis, I obviously went through duty therapy and was seeing a psychologist and released a lot. And it was interesting because in our sessions, I realized how much I devalued myself, how much I overlooked different levels of abuse within myself because of my childhood. And so it was years afterwards, and, and it was, I mean, I started when I came out of, out, of, out of therapy, and I think it was like 2014 or so, my my therapist was like, well, you have a book when you're ready. Just take time because it's going to ruffle a lot of feathers because of, there's a lot of truth in there. Mm-hmm. So so the book is about me reclaiming myself, and, and, and that's where the name from, Reclaiming the Soil. And the idea for the name of the book and the intention was I was in Pukeng. It was during the time when I'd gone home. And I remember walking around the back and I was picking up some soil and I was just letting it, watching it trickle through my hands. And I made the decision that although what it trickles through my fingers, I can never get that back. So that is the language, the culture, the tradition that I'd lost because of my upbringing. And there's nothing I can do about it. But mm. what I have in the palm of my hands is what I can nurture and that will be mine, it will be my secret. And so the, the book is about that. And then also, obviously, my activism does come in because 
over the years, my activism came through after me reclaiming my power. So when I was at varsity, I was beaten up by my, my then boyfriend. And it took me a long time to come to terms with, with what had happened because I come from a privileged background. Mm-hmm. You know, with privilege, there's also a lot of discomfort and negativity. So you, I was always told that, you know, if a man, if a man hits you or somebody hits you, you walk out of the relationship. But also the underlying nuances that we spoke about before, it was always pushed, well, it doesn't happen in good family. And so that confusion for me, because this guy came from a so-called good family. He was wealthy. He, he ticked all the right boxes. He spoke well, all of these different things. Mm. Yet he still did this to me. So with writing the book, it's also about that, of me reclaiming the, my power over the years. And then also realizing, and not realizing, but actually acknowledging a lot of the other abuses that I've suffered within the family, but but also the sexual violence that I'd suffered and had to face that trauma and realize, okay, Rosie, what had happened to you that the fact that you had been raped, but you never, ever told anybody about it. And it still took me a long time to talk about it. And I didn't talk about it in the book, Mm. but it opened up that wound to say, you need to heal. And remember the words that you tell so many other people and the words that you believe is that it wasn't your fault, you know? So, so the book opened up so many different areas in terms of my identity, in terms of my culture and my tradition. And then of course my activism, which went and which went side hand in hand with that. And where does Waka fit into this? So Waka, when I was uh, working on Studio 53 and I traveled the continent and I saw that there was a gap for representation, and then every time I went to like a revisit to the country, obviously created a network of friends and family. And many people would ask me, listen, please, could you look at this contract? Or how can we do this? Or could you train us in this? And I thought, okay, well, there's a gap there. And so I was doing it as a hobby. And um, around about 2010, I realized, okay, this is, this is a working hobby that I could actually make, make a living out of. And I decided to research some names, and I wanted a name that represented either spark or shine or talent, but a word that could sound the same in any language. So whether it's English, whether it's an indigenous language, whether it's French, whatever it is. And mm. I kept on researching, and different names kept, kept coming up until this word waka, which is a Swahili name, loosely translated, it means that that shine. So if, you, if you're if looking at a, a crackling fire, that last bit of spark that goes up into the air, that is referred to as waka. Mm. So so th- that's where I got the name from. And then 2011, I registered the company. I'd already started working with my colleagues from Studio 53, kind of like used them as guinea pigs. So Gaetano was my first one to see how I would navigate this all. And before I knew it, I remember Emne calling me and saying, look, we, we, we need a, somebody who's worked the continent to help us with the next season for Tinsel, which is a, a soapy in, in uh, which was a soapy that was shot in, in Nigeria. But they were also having a, a Kenyan leg. So they, 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 they flew me out to Kenya. We did a casting session there, flew me out to Ghana, did a casting session there, and then another one in, in Nigeria. And then word got out, and before I knew it, people were contacting me. And, and I've been very, very blessed because a lot of the people that have come onto my books have approached us. Um, it's not necessarily going and recruiting. And one of the philosophies behind WAC and what, what I've stuck to is that I will represent facets of the industry that I've worked at so that I know how to navigate that and I have expertise. Mm. So although some of our artists may be musicians in the right, we don't control their music, music careers. Yeah. Clearly because if I were to be put into a studio, I wouldn't know what to do. So why would you want somebody handling your career who has no knowledge of that? I also, some of the people are models in their own right. I don't handle their modeling contracts. So we focus on the TV, radio aspect, the acting, now obviously digital influencing, brand ambassador, and then very much speaking and and emceeing. And then unfortunately, and unfortunately you have some people in your books who haven't done anything. I know. Like, like, <laughs> like, 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 like Coach Buff. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> so so, so what, what always, what struck me and when we, I think I, I, I was doing an event at, um, in Rosebank, um, and you came to the event and then we were chatting afterwards and you were telling me about work. And, and in my mind, I was, I guess, also because of my, my slight biases, but I was like, 
it's unusual for a South African mm. to look at creating something that is truly pan-African just because mm. just because of history and the journey that South Africa is still going into in relation to the rest of the continent. Mm. So was it Studio 53 that just kind of opened you to how did you how do you then navigate different cultures? You know, how, how do you how how do you go into new spaces with new people, new backgrounds, new ways of speaking? Mm. Because even even when you're on holiday, uh, I always mm. find that when I visit a new place, I've eventually found a way of situating myself within a new space because mm. I'm not I'm not the personality to kind of go and say I'm taking over the space and I'm molding it to me. Yeah. So how how do you do it? Studio 53, you know, when it started in 2004, nobody was going into Africa. And that also just also just off the what I was saying about Waka was where where, where I got my first contracts were that a lot of West African and East African big corporate companies were using South African PR and advertising agencies. Hmm. So people will call me and say, well, we need somebody to speak Ghanaian. And I'm like, okay, well, first of all, there's no such language as Ghanaian. Yeah. Um, you can either got uh, English with a Ghanaian accent or pigeon or tree. And so it was, and that knowledge came from working in, with Studio 53. But also the privilege, although it was a challenge at the time, because it was the first show that was going into Africa, our budget was shoestring, if not nothing. Yeah. So we really learned especially as a presenter and then later on as a producer of how do you get six stories out of nothing? How do you get six stories out of, because every time you went to a new space, you had to come back with minimum of six stories. Mm. How do you navigate six stories in a place where the only cameras that possibly could have come there have been from a voyeurism or from a journalist's point of view? Yeah. You know, how do you get people to tell their good side of their story? And so that for me was incredibly, incredibly amazing. So working with people well, while you while you training somebody to become a fixer so that the next production crew, when they come in, they know what to look for, but then also understanding the nuances of, of the different territories and mm-hmm. then discovering which territory works best for me. I love West Africa. I absolutely love Ghana. I love Nigeria, but I'm not cut out for Nigeria. And I acknowledge that and it's fine. I can go in, do whatever I need to do, come out because that energy there is incredibly, incredibly enigmatic. It is fast paced. And if you don't want to watch yourself, you, you will get run over. Mm. However, my energy, for instance, for, for East Africa is something different. And I believe that something must have happened in a previous lifetime that I was born in East Africa because I have a strong spiritual connection to it. So much so that for many years, I used to visit Uganda every year. And it got to the point where, okay, Rose, you just get get yourself a Ugandan passport. And after the whole thing that happened on that production that, that I resigned from, I was like, okay, well, I'm going through this pain and, and I know that I'm not going to be able to get any more acting work. Let me focus and hone in on Waka. Uh, what territory do I want to focus in? And I was like, the, oh, the obvious choice would be Uganda. And I applied for a job and I got it. And it was for a TV station. And my plan was to navigate the Ugandan corporate space and understand you know, how I can adapt to my contracts, how mm. I can adapt to the work that we need to create because it's very different from West Africa and obviously very different from South Africa. Yeah. So so going back to your question of how I navigate that space is I've been fortunate to be on the ground in most of the spaces. Obviously, the English-speaking countries are a lot easier to navigate yeah. because my faith is very, very minimal. But that's, that's how I've navigated. And then also using South Africa's past of how not to treat people in other African countries. And I remember traveling with with a crew. It wasn't even my crew. It was, I think we were going for uh, the face of Africa. It was a bit, but there was a whole big crew coming from various and different South African broadcasters. And the treatment that I saw that they gave people at at customs and crossing the border was so embarrassing. And it wasn't even just on a racial, it wasn't just white and black. It was even our brothers and sisters that treated purely because somebody spoke different. And I was like, okay, this is this is something that as a South African, you can't do coming in. You cannot be seen as a colonizer coming in purely because you come from South Africa. Yeah. And so I made that concerted effort of, of to deal on that level. Even, even when I used to, if you would travel in big groups, 
I would stay back, pretend I'm going to the toilet, and then go through and often they were like, Are you with this group? I'm like, No, I'm not. And and there was a laughing joke because when when I, when we used to carry heavy equipment, I was never ever overcharged. Purely because if you go in with 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 humility, if you go in with respect, because you're visiting somebody else's country, you're going into somebody else's home. Mm. You've got to show respect and understand that their mannerisms are totally different to what we what we how we 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 do and how we work. Is it better than ours? No. Is it less than ours? No. It's just different. Yeah. Um, and I think that is that is also how I've been able to navigate the space for so long and how I've been able to create great synergies and great partnerships because of, of me trying to understand space. And when I can't, then, then I'm honest about it. Mm. And as we wind up, from a personal perspective, how do you, it feels like there's a fluidity to your life. Mm. It's, you know, it's not, I think, I think the let's call a, a group or a tribe of us who live kind of, I guess, outside labels or, mm. or, or carry multiple labels and mm. just kind of watching you move between, you know, the work that you do at Waka, your activism work, the stuff that we don't see, you know. How how do you how do you manage that fluidity? Uh, a lot of the time, I don't know, <laughs> but I think it's easier now because, as you said, it's without labels. And there was a time in my life where I was consumed by labels. I was consumed by face value. I was consumed by, and there's nothing wrong with with, with that, uh, especially with the weaves and all of that. But I'd grown out of it, and I am very intentional about what brings me peace in my life. So if it's relationships, if it's contracts, if it's people, and, and I feel that there's a, a space where we're not connecting, I'll be honest to that. Whereas 10 to 15 years ago, I would overlook that. It's, it's created a lot, of, a lot of difficult conversations. It's also ended relationships, very difficult. And, mm. and that's, that's where the challenge is, because sometimes it's about stepping away from loved ones because you see the synergy isn't there and you can't blame the next person. But at the same time, you've got to keep your peace and you've got to keep your in your immediate space happy and, and, and serene. So at times it feels that I'm not, but but also if I feel that I'm not aligned with, with anything in particular, then I know, okay, so so the fluidity isn't there. There's a block. How do we release that block? How do we let it flow again? And and that comes from years of self-love, years of, of intentional healing on myself uncomfortable conversations that I constantly have with myself. And also, once again, having that end goal, what do I want to achieve in the long run? You know, I've the, I had this, in fact, it was about two, three months ago. It was a huge, huge, huge contract that, that would have been incredibly lucrative to, to Waka. But, you know, like like a lot of corporate contracts where you you read the fine line and then and, and you realize, okay, this doesn't fit in with, with my ethos. This doesn't mm. fit in with a broader picture of who I am. And as I approached them, we spoke about it, and they were like, this is who we are, and this is what we represent, take it or leave it. And, and I made the big choice to leave it. And I'm glad I did, because at least my little humble life, my 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 little baby is still kept intact. It's still um, sticking to the aims and the mission that I want to achieve. The money and all of that will come in other areas. But it's about being constantly looking at your drawing board. And yes, you have your deviations and changes, good. But at the end of at the end of it, at the end of the day, it's about how you want to 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 go to sleep at night. Are you comfortable? Have you hurt the next person? And 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 uh, is the creativity still flowing? Are you still happy with what you're doing? And I knew with a contract like that, and many of them have come before, it would have mean meant signing over something that I would never be able to get back but also jumping onto a bandwagon or uh, a brand that, that would definitely contradict certain things about who I am, what I, what I want to achieve, um, and also the people that, 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 that I represent. I mean, we, 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 we recently had a conversation mm. similar to that. Yeah. Uh, around, around the, you know, operating, operating tied to your values. Um, you know, my father mm. always used to say, as buffers, we have very few principles, but those those principles are are concrete and and they mm. kind of guide every decision and it was mm. interesting for me because we're having this come and it was the first time we'd had that kind of conversation and we're doing it on yeah. whatsapp on text 
yeah. and you know and i was kind of like okay how do i say this in a polite way that mm. if it feels uncomfortable i will just say no yeah and you were like actually perfect like i i'm i'm happy that we're, i'm happy that we're aligned with it because <laughs> be, be, because that choice also comes with you know every choice comes with consequences but that choice also sometimes you you miss certain opportunities well for somebody else looking in they go well that's a lost opportunity meanwhile like you're saying it's being tied to you know what what gives you peace yeah 100% and a lot of people don't get it and that's okay but that's also when we go up against the grain we expect that mm. you know so what does the next year or two look like for you what are you uh, what are you so focused also, on yeah so obviously what I mean I'm um I'm changing strategy a little bit more with you know we'll share with you beginning of next year but uh, I've gone back into to while I was in lockdown I got back into film producing and uh because of what had happened in the industry and other stuff that had happened you know it's very easy to blacklist somebody especially when they speak out and mm. fortunately i was able to tap into to to my ugandan partnerships and i was asked to co-produce a documentary which is the selenyanzi story from uganda yeah so as much as that's been a huge challenge because working with such a phenomenal subject but also who brings so much political attention it 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 really has been a learning curve of producing a show that's in Uganda worrying for the safety of our crew then getting the footage out but because i'm so closely affiliated with Uganda and a public figure we didn't want to send the footage directly to me in case it got seized mm. so literally sending it to another continent and then sending it back so that's what's been happening but also raising funds to set in a lot of film festivals and we're now rearing the end of of production so we're finishing off that and hopefully by by mid year next year you know the the, the show will, will be able to, to have a release date so i'm focusing on that on worker and then also during lockdown i i focused in on my other uh, counseling and life coaching courses and became certified counselor certified life coach registered a, a company registered with a counseling board and i offer counseling to people who who need it working within my scope of practice mm. and then also life coaching and i formulated another program which combines the counseling and life coaching and this idea came from me after i left that production where i was able to tap into other resources because i knew what my other talents and crafts are often people are very focused on what they want to do and there's nothing wrong with that mm. but when when things when life changes then what do we do and so 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 if you've gone through trauma yes the counseling will will give you that support but then at the same time will give the coping mechanisms should you need to to go back into a toxic workspace or if you need to change your career so so so, so over the next couple of years that is what i want to focus on my life coaching was originally supposed to only start in the next 3 to 5 years it was going to be my retirement plan but then covid happened life happened and i was like okay <laughs> I guess it's been brought forward earlier. Yeah. So that's that's where we are now. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the space. It was really cool. The Listen to Your Footsteps podcast is produced by Zebra Culture. If you have ideas of what we can do better, people you'd like us to have a conversation with, or would just like to share a thought, you can email me on info at zebraculture.com. To check out past episodes, go to kojabuffer.com slash podcasts. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share with a friend. If you'd like to get a copy of the book Listen to Your Footsteps, check out kojabuffer.com/book. There are details on the various spaces it's available at. I'd also appreciate it if you could leave a review or comment wherever you listen to your podcasts. Finally, there's the Zebra Culture by Koja Buffer newsletter where on a weekly basis I share a curated list of articles, playlists, videos, etc. that have caught my attention. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed listening to the conversation as much as I enjoyed having it.